this first session, which I'll be moderating, there's a couple of really great talks. Uh, there's some nexus here, we're kind of, if we were to group this, there's a lot of really great watershed monitoring that's happening um, in a local watershed here, local as in um, the Bear River watershed. Um, and then we're gonna move over to the Central Coast for the second talk and um, hear a little bit about work that's being done there with monitoring and, and some new monitoring tools. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker and just make sure, Alexandra, are you on and able to talk and- Yep, I'm on. Controls? Okay, awesome, hi. Um, so Alexandra Cisneros Carey is with the Sierra Streams Institute, and um, Alex graduated from UC Berkeley with a degree in environmental sciences and forestry in 2020. She focused on California plant and vertebrate ecology and natural history, and as an undergrad, developed a passion for research and experimental design while working for freshwater ecology and plant physiology labs. She served as Sierra Stream Institute's AmeriCorps River Scientist in 2020 through 2021 and currently runs the Water Quality Lab and Volunteer Monitoring Program. Alex is interested in data-driven conservation research and the impact of climate change on California's plant communities. Um, and she is applying to graduate school for ecosystem ecology. And with that, Alex, I will turn it over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, Ali. I'm um, Alex Carey, and to, like uh, she said, I'm the Water Quality Lab Manager for Sierra Streams Institute. And today I'm presenting on Community Science Resilience, a 20-year review of watershed monitoring with uh, Sierra Streams Institute. So first I'm gonna give a bit of background about the organization, and then we're gonna get into the data and the trends we're seeing. Okay, so uh, Sierra Streams Institute is a uh, community science watershed research nonprofit. We're located in Nevada City, California, which is the, and in Nevada County, which is the red county outlined in the California in the top right. And we started in 1995 when a group of uh, community members wanted to know how a bridge being built over Deer Creek, which runs through town, would affect water quality. So they organized themselves to start uh, monitoring water for the city. And that grew into Sierra Streams Institute today, where we go out every single month. Uh, and we train citizen scientists to collect water uh, quality parameters and in the field and then bring back samples to test them for uh, E. coli and nutrients uh, in our laboratory. And besides uh, monthly water quality, quality monitoring, we also do uh, swamp bioassessments in the June, in June and October. And we're actually in the middle of one of those uh, uh, assessments right now where teams will walk up the creeks and collect algae and uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, which are those two photos uh, below. So these are some uh, images of the watersheds we monitor. Deer Creek is in the top left, and that's our home base watershed we've been collecting here for, for not, like 20 years now. And um, then Bear River watershed, we only recently started collecting from in 2016. And uh, they kind of fit together like puzzle pieces. You can see a bright green watershed in the Nevada County in the top left. And right underneath it, on, like it, not quite perfectly, but uh, the Bear River will start and the, they both, both the headwaters of the watersheds are up along Highway 20 on the way to Tahoe. Uh, so the water quality parameters we test for uh, are air temperature, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, pH, turbidity, and then in the lab we test for nitrate and phosphate as well as E. coli. And long-term data sets like these are super valuable for understanding uh, the impacts of climate change on uh, watersheds in the Sierra. Sometimes the impacts of climate change are really subtle and won't be, uh, will be a slow buildup. So it's important to have like a long-term uh, data set to compare things to. But sometimes in California, um, there are more intense problems like, or more, you know, the impacts are more intense and 
uh, sudden like wildfires or droughts. And in our local community, wildfires become more of a problem since we're in the Sierra Nevada foothill. And um, this became very, this hit very close to home in August, 2020, which is um, the slide, it says 2021, but it was in August, 2020. We lost our office to the Jones fire. Um, I don't know if people remember, but back in that summer during August, uh, 6,000 lightning strikes hit the ground in California and caused a lot of wildfires all over the state, including the Jones fire. And you can see the burn scar of the fire on the left of the screen. And somewhere in the middle of that is the Sierra Streams office. So we lost our building and our instruments as well as our all of our lab equipment, but no one was injured because the pandemic had already started. So everyone was working from home. So it was a hidden blessing. And we also still had our um, 20 year data set saved up. So uh, this is a reminder to save, save your work on the cloud because your office could burn down and your desktop will be lost. But uh, because we still had our data set, we could rebuild our monitoring, our, our program as soon as we got the equipment again and as soon as we had a space to store and start running our uh, lab analysis. So uh, before we started, restarted the program and brought back our volunteers, we had a good opportunity to uh, reprioritize and look at what was working with the monitoring program and what we could be changing and what we would want our program to focus on for the next 20 years. So one of the first things we did was look through the data set and try to find what sites were serving as um, indicators for other parts of the watershed. So maybe one site was really tracking the same trends as another site, so much so that we could just use that um, latter site to know what was happening in that part of the watershed instead of going out to both sites, which uh, would save time and resources and allow us to uh, focus on parts of the watershed that maybe were more understudied or uh, maybe had more um, vulnerabilities. We also wanted to know uh, where in the watershed the impacts of climate change were already being uh, seen. So we found which sites were uh, potentially most uh, vulnerable, which sites were um, being changed the most in terms of our trends, like maybe they were having the higher rates of nutrients or higher uh, water temperature trends than other sites, and which sites then could be um, more resilient to climate change, potentially as climate refugia. Uh, for example, in the top part of the watershed, the first green dot is site one, which is the headwaters. And while most of the watershed is um, increasing in water temperature, that site is staying pretty uh, level because of it's a pretty let not non-impacted uh, area. So potentially that could be protected as fish habitat for, or um, um, climate refugia for things that can't really handle um, the changing water temperature trends. And we also wanted to know uh, what places we could monitor to understand the impacts of wildfire in our area. For example, uh, we recently started monitoring more sites on the Bear River. We're working with Placer and Nevada County to track the impact of another different recent fire that started this past August called the River Fire, which actually um, started right next to the Bear River. So we're going to start tracking to see how the burn scar will move into the river and how it will impact water quality uh, as the first winter storms start coming in. So here's a graphic of some of the predicted trends under climate change. The left side of the graphics uh, relevant to California. So California is going to experience hotter and drier conditions in the coming years. And those hotter, drier conditions will um, cause the water temperature to increase in our streams, as well as to have like, lower um, water levels in general. And when the streams are getting warmer, that means that dissolved oxygen levels are decreasing because the solubility of oxygen decreases as temperature increases. And uh, we're also going to see uh, more severe droughts and um, having less water in the streams means that um, there'll be higher levels of conductivity because there'll be higher concentrations of minerals or uh, nutrients floating in the water, which in conductivity is another thing we test for. 
but climate change isn't all just uh, linear lines. Sometimes it also just means more dramatic seasonal variation. So we're going to see a lot more um, flashiness or crazy uh, variability in our in our graphs due to uh, climate change. So let's see. These are some just a few of the uh, parameters that we test for: uh, air temperature, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, and connectivity, all for Deer Creek from 2001 to 2020. And you can see, slight, like from the slight uptick, uh, air temperature is slowly increasing in Deer Creek uh, since 2001. And you can see the uh, seasonal variation between winter and summer. And rather than everything just getting warmer, it's more looking like that the winter, the winter lows are getting warmer than they used to be. So they're not as cold. Whereas the highs in the summer, while they're not uh, steadily jumping up and like jumping forward, they're staying about the same and having less variability. And that is mimicked in the water temperature graph where the winter lows are getting warmer and the summer highs are staying about the same. And in a different watershed, you might see a higher warming trend for water temperature, but Deer Creek is broken up by several reservoirs and dams that uh, do bottom releases of cold water. So uh, while the whole watershed is slightly increasing in temperature, uh, there are some sites that are, aren't experiencing that warming trend or even experiencing a slight cooling trend just because it's not like a natural flow of water. It's still, in, it's still controlled by the irrigation district. And then if you go to the bottom right, dissolved oxygen, it's slightly decreasing over time, which falls in line with our predicted trends from the previous graphic. And the data points are also getting more condensed, uh, which suggests that maybe we're getting uh, better at collecting dissolved oxygen and um, training our volunteers and citizen scientists to uh, know what is a normal reading and know what would, is standing out maybe is an instrument error. And connectivity, uh, the red line is actually slightly increasing or sorry, decreasing over time, which is not what we predicted. Um, connectivity under a drought, we would think would be increasing over time because there's less water. But again, this might be because uh, the Deer Creek watershed is not a natural system. It has a lot of water input from the city and from the irrigation district. So maybe they're keeping it high enough that it's not uh, lowering to increase connectivity. And these graphs are for the Bear River, the same parameters, air temperature, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, connectivity. And you can see the air temperature and uh, water temperature and dissolved oxygen well, air temperature and water temperature are increasing over time, and dissolved oxygen is, de is decreasing, which falls in line with our predictions under climate change. But unlike in the Deer Creek system, Bear River connectivity is increasing over time. And that could be because uh, the Bear River is a really impacted river with not much protection. Uh, it can be kept at very low levels because it feeds into the Yuba and, and feeds into other irrigation districts and isn't kept at uh, as high a water level as Deer Creek, as they like to keep Deer Creek. And it also goes through more degraded sites like quarries, which uh, could have higher runoff that would increase the ions in the water and, and increase the connectivity. So the fact that it's increasing so steadily maybe is a sign that we need to do more uh, regulations and more monitoring of the Bear River system, since it's a really huge watershed that st starts again um, up towards Tahoe and goes all the way towards Yuba City. Let's see. And here is a graph of uh, water temperature and dissolved oxygen as a linear regression. So this is for just the Deer Creek uh, system. And we can see the relationship really clearly where water temperature is increasing and dissolved oxygen is decreasing. And But then if you break it up by time of year, so the dry season and the rainy season, um, you can see that it isn't quite as, like it, it, it does matter what time of year it is in the water levels. So the dry season, it's a tighter uh, fit, so which makes sense because uh, when it's really, when it's summer, the water, the air temperature is a bigger uh, input 
on the water temperature. So um, dissolved oxygen is probably more highly following uh, water temperature. But when you look at the rainy season, uh, while there's more variability, there's actually a steeper relationship. And that might be because in the cold season, uh, despite there being a lot of variability, the water temperature, the, the shifts in water temperature uh, more intensely trigger the shifts in dissolved oxygen. Um, and that might have to do with the fact that, uh, you know, the, the winter is, uh, has a great, winter here at least has a really broad range in temperature. So it is uh, a greater shift that could be occurring. But the variability could be from the fact that uh, not every rainy season is very wet and there's a lot of dry. Um, there's, there's often a lot, like due to the drought, there's several months that usually were raining but are now pretty dry. And that could explain why um, it's less of a tight fit relationship. But these are just uh, two of the related trends from what we've gathered. And there's a lot more to explore in both the Deer Creek and, water, and Bear River watershed. So if you have any uh, questions, uh, you can email me at alex at sierrastreamsinstitute.org, um, or you can ask them in the chat. But thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. So we do have some time for questions. If there are questions, and just a reminder, I'm going to go to this next slide. Um, if you go to your Zoom webinar, there's a Q&A button. Click on it, and you can ask away if you have questions for Alex. And it looks like we may have a couple. Yeah. Um, so Alex, we've got a question for you. What kind of trends are you seeing with benthic macroinvertebrates? Right. Um, so depending on the site, uh, there are different trends. We are seeing in the Bear River that the benthic macroinvertebrates are, um, it, it just, it's a smaller community that we're gathering and usually uh, BMI can indicate water quality health. So uh, depending on the health of the water, we're seeing more like more diverse communities in the more uh, protected and cleaner parts of the Deer Creek compared to the more degraded uh, Bear River sections. Awesome, thank you. And we've got another question for you. Which sites had the highest water temperatures and why do you think that they did? The highest water temperatures occur uh, in the lower parts of both watersheds because um, they're lower elevation and also they're a lot more open. We go from uh, mixed conifer forest in the upper watersheds of both Bear River and Deer Creek to uh, open oak woodland. So there's a lot more uh, sun hitting the water, which is uh, increasing the water temperature in general. But that's also complicated because uh, the, again, there are several dams for um, Deer Creek. So right underneath the dam, the water quality tends, to, I mean, the water temperature tends to be a lot colder than uh, the surrounding areas. Okay. All right, and we've got a few more questions rolling in. Um, do you store the macroinvertebrate data or have you developed an index of biological integrity at all? Uh, we do store the um, BMIs. We store them in ethanol and uh, we actually have uh, pretty long-standing volunteer program where volunteers will come in and uh, sort and ID uh, the insects. And I think we do have an index of biological integrity. I think a previous AmeriCorps developed it. Um, I haven't seen it, but if you email me, I can uh, let send it to you. All right. Awesome, Alex. There's more questions. Um, and I think we've got three minutes. So we'll work through what we can. Are there stream restoration projects in your monitoring area? And if so, have you seen any changes in water quality? Yeah, we have um, so three of our sites are on a property that we have access to. We call it Deer Creek Ranch. And we have a longstanding restoration project there where we're planting uh, willows and other shady trees by the water to increase um, or to decrease water temperature through shade. And also, um, Several, we also uh, plant like nitrate fixing plants so to prevent like runoff from going into the water as much. But we're looking for more projects too. All right. And how about your community volunteers? Do you find that you have a pretty um, consistent and good turnout with those guys? 
We have, um, we're really lucky to have a lot of volunteers who have been with us for the entire 20 years of Sierra Streams. There was a bit of a, a lag after COVID as people were like hesitant to leave their homes and come out and help. But um, it's a really great community up here of volunteers who um, love Deer Creek and love getting out and trying to understand what's happening, like how climate change is impacting their surrounding area for themselves. So um, we have a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty consistent community. All right. And um, another question, how about the trends in percent concentrations of O2 and specific, conduct specific conductance at 25 degrees Celsius? Hmm. Yeah, our, well, our dissolved oxygen concentrations are decreasing for uh, both watersheds, but I haven't looked at it based on at just 25 degrees. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll add that to my, my list of um, data questions. Awesome. All right, a few more, Alex. You got a lot of interest here. So um, how do you analyze the nutrients and are your data, data available in CDEN? So we use a Hawk calorimeter in the lab and they send us test tubes for phosphate and nitrate. So we just add the samples with uh, pipettes and uh, put them in the calorimeter and that's how we estimate it. And I, we do um, enter our data into CDEN. I don't know if we've entered it recently due to the fire, but um, we're going to get that rolling again soon. Awesome. I know it's a time, it's time consuming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, a couple more questions here. I don't know if we'll get to both of them. Um, as far as the bioassessment monitoring, are you following swamp protocols? And yep. is that you kind of address this if it goes into seed in, which it does as time allows. Yeah, we're only doing, we're not doing the physical habitat surveys this year. We're just doing algae and benthic macroinvertebrates, but yeah, we're following the protocols. All right, awesome. And there's one more question, but in the interest of time, I think we'll copy that question over to you in the chat so you can address it separately. But again, thank you so much, Alex, for this excellent talk, and hopefully we'll be working with you soon. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Okay, so um, our next speaker then in this session is Sarah Stinson. And Sarah, you should have control, looks like you do. Um, Sarah, it, let's see here, that's your abstract. Sarah is a PhD candidate in ecology at UC Davis in the Conan and Lawler labs. Her current research focuses on effects of pesticides of emerging concern on aquatic invertebrates and fish. Research focuses uh, out using molecular techniques and behavioral assays. Her professional interests include aquatic ecotoxicology, molecular ecology, and environmental justice. And in addition to her scientific pursuits, she was a professional dancer for 15 years and teaches dance classes in Sacramento. Uh, when not pipetting small volumes of clear liquids into other liquids, she's usually camping, coding, or crafting. Nice to have you, Sarah, and I'm going to turn it over to you for your talk. Thank you, Allie. I'd like to thank the organizers for having me. It's a real honor to be here. And I'm excited to talk to you about this project, which will be the basis for one of my PhD chapters. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about macroinvertebrate distribution across an impacted watershed in the California Central Coast and some of the implications that this project may have for future monitoring efforts. Oops. And it's not letting me forward my slides. Oh, there we go. Maybe there was just a little bit of a delay. Here we go. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, first of all, the uh, various individuals and organizations who have helped make this project possible, including my academic advisors, as well as the Department of Pesticide Regulations who funded the study. Um, special thanks to Shin Dang and his team for all of their support. Um, and also some of the people who have provided both um, uh, library preparation assistance with um, my sequencing samples and also analysis assistance with the bioinformatics. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge that the samples were collected on lands that were traditionally held by several indigenous tribes of California. So some of you may already be very familiar with this study system, but I'll go ahead and, and give you the overview in case you aren't. 
Um, the Salinas River watershed is located on the central coast of California. It's an important riparian corridor for many species of concern, some of which I've pictured below, uh, who either use the river itself for habitat or the surrounding riparian uh, land. Um, unfortunately, this area is also heavily impacted because of urban and agricultural land use. So swamp and other, um, other state agencies do monitoring here, both looking at water chemistry and um, biological integrity at several sites through this area. So some of the bioassessment methods that have been used previously by Swamp and others are looking at macroinvertebrate macro benthic communities, as you heard from Alex's talk previously. And the map on the left shows both Monterey County and San Luis Obispo County outlined in purple. And um, here are the previous California Stream Condition Index scores that have been attained from previous swamp monitoring efforts in this area. Um, and as you can see, there's a very wide range of CSCI values that have been obtained throughout the watershed. Um, and the downstream site of the Salinas River, which is at the top left of the map here, uh, has consistently yielded very low water quality. And in other studies, we see frequent detections of many chemicals of concern, uh, usually agricultural pesticides and others. So um, this is an interesting study area because it incorporates a wide range of habitat quality. Um, and these assessments are, um, as many of you know, are, are difficult and time consuming and often require taxonomic expertise, which is, is limited. And having done um, some of this traditional bioassessment myself, I can testify to the fact that it is very difficult and time consuming. Um, it's a, it's a difficult process. So in this study, um, I set out to answer a few different questions. Uh, the first more basic question is, can we even detect these sensitive species using eDNA, environmental DNA metabarcoding in this watershed? And not just the sensitive organisms, but can we also detect maybe key invasives or specific threatened or endangered taxa using this method? Um, and then also I was curious to know how our previously assessed CSCI scores uh, aligned with these detections in the metabarcoding data and comparing most versus least impacted sites and how their taxonomic distribution varied with this method. So I'll go into that now. Um, briefly, uh, we collected samples from sites, 23 sites, throughout the watershed. This included both the main Salinas River, but also its major tributaries as well. And for these sites, I picked three transects, which were downstream from riffle habitats, and collected 50 milliliters of sediment, uh, across 10 subsamples, which we determined from previous pilot data that this would be sufficient to find rare taxa. And um, we also went ahead and collected some additional samples from the highest quality sites. So we added uh, water filtrate to our sampling for those sites, as well as traditional kick netting, which I used three kicks across each transect for the three transects. Um, additionally, we also measured water quality parameters, dissolved oxygen temperature, conductivity, pH, etc. And for all of the um, molecular samples, they were put on dry ice immediately in the field and then stored at minus 80 to avoid any degradation of our samples. And the methods, I could spend a long time talking about them, but I'll keep it brief since I think the results are more interesting to discuss. But if you're curious to know more about any of the steps that I took in the methods, um, I followed the Cal eDNA projects protocols, which are available online in, in great detail. So you can go on and download uh, in-depth protocols for each of the steps. And as part of this study, I looked at several different um, primer pairs, different markers 
to target different taxonomic groups. And for this talk, I'm only going to be talking about one of the CO1 markers, which is very good at finding invertebrate taxa. But um, some additional analyses is currently uh, underway for these other markers as well. And the sequencing was performed at the Genome Center at UC Davis. Um, this slide has a lot of uh, information on it. I think it's important to communicate what steps are performed in any sequencing study um, once, once you've reached the bioinformatics stage. So on the left, you'll see I followed the Crux and Anacapa pipelines. And those are basically a way to generate custom reference sequence databases to assign taxonomy to the DNA sequences that I obtained from my samples. And then Anacapa sorts those by sample and by marker, matches them to their taxonomy, and performs quality control and filtration. We also performed several um, quality assurance and quality control steps throughout this process to ensure that um, what we, the taxons that we were seeing were actually representative of our sites and not some result of cross-contamination or laboratory contamination. So just an overview of what we found from this particular marker. In our sediment samples, we detected common families um, in our sequence data, including um, chironomids, simulids, so all taxa that we may expect to find in a um, benthic sample. So that was consistent with our sample type and with these locations. Uh, we were able to identify more fish species from our water filtrates, which is perhaps unsurprising because um, we have perhaps a better representation of fish in the water column versus in the sediment, unless you had some um, tissue samples being deposited into the sediment. Uh, interesting though, we were unable to match 35% of the sequences obtained with taxonomy in the reference database. This could be a function of the fact that taxonomic sequence databases are still being developed, and some taxonomic groups are not well represented in those databases yet. So um, this, is, this is perhaps something that could be reanalyzed at a later date and we could obtain additional taxa as those databases become, um, improve on their coverage. Um, so we, on the left-hand side, on the top graph here, this is showing the total number of sequence reads obtained from each of our samples. And I included that to show that um, we didn't have any outliers as far as being unable to obtain sequence reads from a sediment sample. Sediment is a difficult sample type because you can have microbial action or other PCR inhibitors that might prevent you from being able to amplify and identify your sequences. So we did obtain a good number of reads from all samples, and those reads were assigned to uh, what is referred as, to as amplicon sequence variants. Um, this is similar to OTUs, if you've seen other metabarcoding studies, but basically it is a way to cluster sequences into related groups uh, without assigning taxonomy. So these are um, closely re related sequences, but not assigned to taxonomy. But then on the right, we show that they were assigned to over 1,600 uh, species and across 29 phyla. So this marker is designed to capture a broad range of, of taxa, and we were able to do that. Oh, okay, I do not see my Venn diagram showing up in the slide. I'm not sure why, um, but I think there's sufficient uh, information here that I can describe it briefly. So we wanted to compare what sorts of taxonomy we were obtaining from our water filtrate versus sediment. And the number on the left, the 86, is the total number of family level taxa that were obtained from a water filtrate for one of our sites, one of the more, um, in theory, biodiverse sites. And on the right, we obtained um, 34 sediment specific family, and 42 is the number that was overlap. So between these two sample types, we saw some overlap in the family level taxonomy that we discovered, but significant differences as well. So apologies that this Venn diagram doesn't seem to be showing up, but I'm happy to send you the slides 
if anyone is interested to see them. Uh, moving on to some of our sensitive um, macroinvertebrate species, um, I was curious to see what detections we were obtaining for these groups specifically across our sites, and I organized this by CSCI score. So at the top left, you'll see the lowest score, um, followed by the sites that had no previous score, and then moving up in, in habitat quality index. So in summary, we detected these sensitive macroinvertebrates only in sites that had a previously determined CSCI score above about 0.7, which is in that 0.6 to 0.8 category, um, and increasingly as CSCI score increased, which is consistent with what we expected to find, which is that sensitive macroinvertebrates um, do not do well in sites with war poor water quality or poor habitat quality. There we go. Um, next, we were interested to look at the amplicon sequence variance detections per CSCI score for our sites. And again, this is indicative that we are detecting sequences and uh, from even low quality sites. So we're not seeing any PCR inhibition that would swamp out our, our ability to detect um, sequence reads in general. And that we do see a slight increase in these numbers at higher um, CSCI values, but it's not a consistent increase across CSCI increased values. Uh, looking at family level taxa per CSCI score, we do see that in our highest quality sites, um, we do see a slight increase, but again, it's not necessarily a linear increase from lowest to highest. So we are seeing different, um, different biodiversity representative in the lower quality sites, not just a lower number of family level taxa at these sites. Um, so then I'm, I was curious to look at the dissimilarity between the sites based solely on their CSCI value. So this is a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. Um, it's set on three axes, which I've rotated a little bit so that you can see the clusters more clearly. But basically groups that cluster uh, further apart from other groups are more dissimilar uh, so if they're close together, they're more similar. If they're further apart, they are less similar. And you can see that our lowest quality sites definitely differentiate, and they are much more uh, dissimilar than the higher quality sites in general. Um, although there is some differentiation of the most high quality sites, this does overlap slightly with the, um, the 0.8 to 1.0 level. And then kind of reaching the end here, I've just got one or two more slides. Um, next, I wanted to look at how does dissimilarity, how is dissimilarity represented across both the water quality and the water body that these sites were collected in? Because in theory, if you have higher hydrologic connectivity, you may have a better chance of dispersal for a lot of these groups. Um, different groups have different dispersal methods and distances, of course. Um, but this was just to look at, at water body in general. So Tembladero Slough, which is TEM, and Sal DPR, which are the most highly impacted sites from the study, are clearly much different in their, um, in their sequence data than other sites. Salinas River is, is also separating out from many of the main, um, main tributaries, which is interesting. So this was a preliminary foray into my metabarcoding data set. There's a lot more uh, data or information that I'd like to extract from this, but um, the initial assessments do indicate that environmental DNA can detect a wide range of taxa in these sites. Um, but as you saw from um, some of that initial data, that some of the sequences were not assigned to taxonomy and so the uh, reference sequence databases do need to be improved. Sensitive taxa were detected only at sites with higher CSCI scores, which is what we expected to find, and that dissimilarity increased with um, differences in CSCI score and also um, with distance, physical distance. 
I'd like to point out that um, this is not designed to replace traditional bioassessment methods, but could be a very helpful complement to those techniques. Um, and of course, you can't get information from sequences such as um, the age of the organism that you're collecting or instar uh, stage. You can't get information about behavior or there, there's a lot of things that were limited in with assessment assessments with only looking at sequences. Also, the CSCI scores were obtained um, from swamp databases and they were collected across different time points. So it's likely that those values have shifted based on season or year. Um, so I'd like to point that out as a limitation. So this is an uh, overview of, um, of molecular biomonitoring, which should, in my opinion, incorporate both sequencing as well as traditional um, uh, bioassessment methods to both ground truth the sequence data that you're you're referencing, but also to gain those sorts of uh, metadata that we can't get just from sequence data alone. And with that, I would like to say thank you for your time and attention and ask if anyone has questions. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And we do have question in the chat for you. So um, at sites with the lowest CSCI scores, you have slightly higher ASB richness. Do these represent novel taxa that aren't found at sites with higher scores, for example, more non-insects? That's a great question. Um, so I still need to do some of the beta diversity analyses for, these, for this data. It's possible that they do represent different taxa than what we're seeing in higher sites. And I'm very curious to learn more about uh, what is actually in those sites and how that varies um, between CSCI score. Awesome. All right. And another question for you first, um, a comment. This is very cool work. And what's the estimated cost of sampling and sequencing eDNA samples for BMI taxa from start to finish? That is a great question. And I have an Excel spreadsheet that itemizes all the costs for each step. Um, however, my cost estimation may be slightly outdated because the technology is getting cheaper very rapidly. And when I initially made that spreadsheet, I think it was in 2019. So I, um, I'd have to double check to see what the cost is per sample. I feel like it was in the $50 range, but I could be way off, especially now that some time has passed and things are continuing to get you uh, more inexpensive, less expensive. Um, so the, the sequencing that I did at the UC Davis Genome Center was on a MySeq uh, with 300 paired end sequencing. And when I ran it, it cost $1,700 to run all of my samples. Although there are some additional costs with library prep and um, reagents for this kind of thing are a little pricey. So um, I'd be happy to share that if people want to reach out to me by email. Again, with the caveat that it's probably cheaper than what my original estimate um, is. A good thing. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then a few more questions for you. Um, let's see. So for river systems, how do you ensure that taxa being detected through eDNA are local to the sampling site and that the DNA source is not higher up in the watershed? That is a great question and um, is a topic of discussion in the field um, for sure. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to compare water filtrate with sediment because um, the sediment samples should be more representative of the immediate community. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that you don't have um, as much flow. So in the samples in the water column, DNA obtained from the water column is obviously moving uh, with the current downstream. And so uh, there are a number of really excellent papers looking at rivers as um, um, as conveyor belts of DNA. And so that was one question I had. And I, I have a feeling that um, the higher number of family level detections from our water filtrate is representative of taxa that are upstream from the sampling site versus what we're seeing in the sediment, which is, is representative more of the immediate community. 
And um, some support for that was in our pilot study, we looked at how many subsamples of sediment we would need to collect per site to find macroinvertebrates because as you may know from traditional sampling, they are really patchily distributed in their habitat. So that's why you do multiple transects, multiple kicks, is to find all the biodiversity from the sample. So we tried to replicate that in our, in our sediment sampling approach. And we found that common taxa were detected among all subsamples, but that rare taxa were only representative in a subset of those. So we did 17 subsamples and we found rare taxa in four of those um, for some rare taxa. So it's a great question. I don't think we can rule out the fact that maybe some sequences are from other places. Um, you may have a bird that um, defecates in the water and then you see some of what that bird was eating, for example. Um, but you can also use things like ground truthing and doing accompanying kick netting to um, verify what you're seeing in your sequencing data. Awesome, thank you. And let's see, we've got just about one more minute here and there's a couple questions. Um, so how about, can you talk a little bit about the library and what the methodology for establishing them is for aquatic species? And that might be offline. I don't know if that's a short yeah, answer. <laughs> um, I, think, I think the question is about the reference library, um, yeah. not the library preparation. And the reference library, um, it's, it's, a, it's more than I can go into in one minute, but I'd be happy to answer that by email. And I'll put my email in the chat. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Sarah. And there are, there's another question, but we'll get those off to you so you can address them. Um, and thank you again. That was an excellent talk. And I know we're ready to break here, but we do have some work, as you're aware, with the Swamp Bioassessment Program and using molecular methods in eDNA. Um, we also have, at the end of the show, I've got a slide I'll share with everybody. Um, one of our staff sites is working on a project um, with these like easy to deploy eDNA kits and we're looking for partners. So um, I will get that slide up during our break and please feel free to reach out for questions. We'll talk more to it later.